Congregation, when it comes around, please join us in singing our welcoming song. <laughs> beliefs and experiences, nurturing the liberal religious spirit, and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, or with us this morning for the first time, we are glad you're here. I'm Jessica Miller, the worship associate today. Our service is led by our minister, Reverend Sharon Wiley. Our worship musician this morning is Tim McKnight, and our song leaders are Patty Carlisle and Tom Carlstrom. Our tech team is Hope Campbell, Sarah Komnick, and uh, we've got Dean Gadette back there as well this morning, and our greeters are Ann McKiernan and Debbie Ressler. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Welcome to those of you here in the chapel and those of you watching live using Zoom. Would you mind turning the down or something? Thank you. Uh, for those of us here in the chapel, you will notice that we have the windows open. This is to ensure good air circulation in the room. There are also four air purifiers in the room, but please feel free to leave the chapel if you are uncomfortable for any reason. You'll be able to hear what's happening with the service inside, outside on the courtyard. We are always delighted to see newcomers joining us in worship. As a newcomer, you might be interested in the groups and activities that we offer. A good way to get this information is through our email newsletter and our e-news calendar. Online newcomers will also receive an email invitation to join our email list after the service. In-person newcomers, if you haven't already given us your email address when you sign in, please share it before you leave. Our weekly email is the best way to get information about the many groups and activities we offer here at Chalice. Now, let's take a breath together.
Good morning. According to the Library of Congress, the first permanent Euro-American settlements began a pattern of displacement and land appropriation of indigenous people that continued until the 20th century. In this region that we consider home, the Kumeyaay first lived here for over 10,000 years and were the people who greeted the Spanish when they first sailed into the San Diego Harbor in 1542. With this awareness, we acknowledge that Chalice is located on the stolen tribal ancestral homeland of the Apai, which is part of the Kumeyaay Nation and the Payamkawicham Nation. This acknowledgement reminds us that we live in a history-driven present and that we need to be intentional with this land and with the people indigenous to the land. Mary Lyons from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe states, when we, the indigenous people, talk about land, land is part of who we are. It is a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. According to the research done with Reclaiming Native Truth, 40% of Americans do not believe that indigenous people still exist in the U.S. Chalice hopes that with our first step of land acknowledgement, we can move towards educating ourselves and others about indigenous communities and their rich and diverse culture and create a meaningful relationship with them as well. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I'd like to invite Steve Schlesinger to light our chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting words come from Francis Cozier. May we light this chalice this morning to remind us of the power and beauty of balance and contrast. It is darkness that can make the flame of a single candle so powerful and light that deepens those shadows in turn. A chalice flame is the meeting point the union of the refuge, safety, and incredible beauty of darkness, and the warmth, the assurance, and the joy of light. May this act of lighting our chalice this morning remind us that we are stronger together in all of the complexities and the disagreements of relationship because we are different and because we are one.
The words of our call to worship come from the Reverend Rachel Hayes. We come together this morning with hearts that are ready, hearts that are heavy, hearts that are broken, and hearts that are full. Our hearts are learning to be brave. Our hearts have been brave longer than we can bear. And we come together because this thing we do, daring to bring our open hearts together, matters. In this time, we practice presence, we practice tenderness, we practice compassion. We come together to practice presence with one another, tenderness with those we meet and with our own aching hearts, compassion for all the world. Spirit of life and love, we enter this moment together with open hearts. May the compassion we share fill up and overflow this space and time and be part of the turning of the tide to more peace, more justice, and more love throughout the earth. Amen. You're invited to rise in body or spirit to join in singing. Amen. Our hymn of the month is hymn number 1012 in the Teal Hymnal, When I Am Frightened. We'll sing this hymn at each service this month to help us get to know the hymn better and to feel more comfortable singing it. Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. We begin by marking a loss. Richard Quartz, one of our members, passed away a week ago. 
in recognition of his physical death, we extinguish the flaming chalice that marks our gathering. We now light a candle of remembrance in recognition that Richard's influence on our community endures. Finally, we relight our flaming chalice in recognition that through our memories of Richard and through the blessings of his many contributions here, our congregation is strengthened and renewed. The light of our community shines ever on. In mystery we are born, in mystery we live, and in mystery we die. Here in the chapel, you are welcome to write your joy or sorrow onto a candle card, which will be collected from you. Online, please write your joy or sorrow, including your name, into the chat box. These joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud, and then we will remove this part of the service from the recording that goes onto our YouTube channel, so this sharing won't become publicly available online. So we have a few minutes of music for you, so you can write down what you would like to share. And if you would like to send me a confidential note about your joy or sorrow, or to make a prayer request, please email me. My email address will be on screen in just a moment.
we light our final <coughs> pillar candle this morning for all the joys and sorrows in the room and in our community that may go unshared and unspoken this morning. These two are held in the love and support of our community. And now we'd like to invite the children and anyone else who would like to come forward for a story. Our story is called Dream, a tale of wonder, wisdom, and wishes, written by Susan Bosack and illustrated by 15 different illustrators. Once, long ago, when all the stars were born, I was a baby. My favorite color was yellow, the color of the sun that peeked in my window in the morning. When you're a baby, you're cuddled and comforted in your own cozy little world. You smile and gurgle and fuss and cry and get fed and need changing and sleep and dream. When my legs began to take me places, my favorite colors were bright, like rip roaring red. There's a whole world to explore, watching bubbles burst in your bath, tasting honey on toast, smelling every single flower in the garden, listening to laughter and thunder, touching your mother's face and your very own toes. As I got bigger, my favorite colors were those of a rainbow, like the violet arc across the sky, so real, I could almost reach up and touch it. There's a whole world to imagine, castles in your backyard, pumpkins transformed into gilded carriages, fairy friends who play with you all day, monsters that crouch in dark corners at night, wishes you make on stars. When I became a teenager, I liked blue. Everyone likes blue. There's a whole world to figure out. You think about finally growing up, who you are, what's important, where you're going, why you're going there, when the right time is, how it all fits together. And you think about having a good time along the way. Then I was a grown-up, young and strong. My favorite colors were simple black and white. It was easy to tell yes from no. There's a whole world to conquer, and you know exactly what you want. To make your own way, to be okay, to belong, to know things, to be you and make a mark on the world. Great men and great women, some famous, most not. Great ideas, the impossible made possible. Great hopes and joys, fears and sorrows, and all the living in between. But as the days became years that spun by, my simple black and white world turned gray, the color of a dismal day. You hear so many voices. No way, they say, you're dreaming. Or to yourself, you say, things weren't supposed to be this way. You get tired, or maybe confused or scared. Maybe there's just too much, too big, too long, too hard. All you want to do is hide your head under the covers of your bed. It was gray, gray, gray. I didn't like gray. Then something happened. It will always happen, if you're looking. It might be a smile, a wink, a nod from someone you don't know. It might be a hug from someone who loves you. It might be a word or an idea carried on the wind from others. Or it might be a little nudge from deep inside you. 
get up. And then you understand the secret to dreaming a dream, that is. I was older and strong once again. My favorite color was green, the color of go and the color of grow. I understood that the world at its best is green. Dreams grow like seeds. They need to take root, then stretch toward the sun. They grow slowly. They must be tended to. And sometimes a gray day gives them just the rain they need. There's something else, too. I understood that to grow a dream, you need more than the one I was. You need the believe of childhood, the do of youth, and the think of experience. You need all three. There's the wisdom to fill a tooth, simple and not so simple all at once. Believe, do, think. So, now I am very old. My favorite color, yellow, the color of the billion billion stars that sparkle in the night sky. I have dreamed a lifetime of dreams. I reached many of them, not all, but many. Many also changed along the way. What I have most are fine memories. When you're as old as I am, you still dream dreams, but they're different. Mostly their wishes for those who follow. Look up, up, up into those billion, billion sparkling stars. What dreams do you find? Little dreams, big dreams, each a hope looking for a life to make it real, a life like yours. Be a dreamer with everything around you, with everything before and after you, with everything that is you. Dream a dream, your very own dream. Please join in singing the children to their classes. Wander a path with a song so sweet That everywhere you go there is love all around Walk on your path with a song so sweet That everywhere you go there is love all around Our reading this morning comes from poet Maxine Human a white American woman born in 1925. This poem is called The Envelope. It's true, Martin Hedegar, as you have written, I fear to cease, even knowing that at the hour of my death, my daughters will absorb me, even knowing they will carry me about forever inside of them, an arrested fetus, even as I carry the ghost of my mother under my navel, a nervy little androgynous person a miracle folded in lotus position. Like those old pear-shaped Russian dolls that open at the middle to reveal another and another, down to the pea-sized irreducible minimum. May we carry our mothers forth in our bellies. May we, born onward by our daughters, ride in the envelope of almost infinity, the chain letter good for the next 25,000 days of their lives. When I planned this service a month ago, I had pictured this as a fairly lighthearted time to bring you all up to speed on denominational business. But here we are at the close of a week that has seen the death of yet another beloved congregant, war broken out in the Middle East, and the difficult decision to take down our Black Lives Matter flag 
in response to the messiness of social media postings and online gossip. My heart is heavy, and I know that many, for many of you, your hearts are heavy too. What's on my heart now, as I think of the changes and challenges before us, we are in the middle of a significant generational shift in our country, in our denomination, and in our congregation. After the world slowing to what felt like a standstill during the pandemic, now it suddenly feels like time is moving too fast, that change is coming too quickly. Questions about generational differences and age are part of the conversation in a way that they weren't five or six years ago. I was recently asked by a congregant if I thought President Biden was too old to run for president again. Some prominent politicians have stayed in public office into their 80s, prompting newsletter articles questioning their ability to serve. Dianne Feinstein, who just passed away, was 90 and still serving as a United States Senator. Baby boomers are now roughly between the ages of 59 and 78. I remember that many of you in this generation were surprised at the start of the COVID pandemic that you were considered to be seniors <laughs> and in a high risk category because of your age. Three years later, I suspect it feels very different now, not least of all because the pandemic aged us all. As some of you shared with me earlier this week, seeing several of your friends, loved ones, in the congregation die this year has brought home in a fresh way your own sense of mortality, your own sense that time is short and precious. I hear from you that that feels vulnerable. Adding to that sense of vulnerability are our changing bodies, our minds that don't work quite as quickly or sharply as they used to, problems in our feet, knees, and hips hearts, ears, and adding to that observance is that the world is changing, that younger people seem interested in and excited by things that might not seem that interesting or exciting to you. It's a challenge to feel yourself not quite at the center of things the way you used to be. I'm naming all this because we are an intentionally multi-generational community. One of the many reasons we are here is to build connections across generational differences, to get to know people not just in our peer group. And in multi-generational community, we need to be aware of the challenges that people in other generations are facing, as well as their interests. It is okay to look across the generations and not fully understand each other, as long as we keep our curiosity about our differences and not turn away from learning more together. One of the places we see and wrestle with the differences between generations of Unitarian Universalists is at our annual denominational gathering each year in June, what is called the General Assembly of Congregations, GA. Typically beginning on a Wednesday evening and concluding on Sunday morning, this gathering is for shared worship, learning, and for the conducting of denominational business. This year's GA was held in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Two chalice congregants attended in person, and two chalice congregants and I attended online. We were three baby boomers and two Gen Xers. I know from my own experience that the world of General Assembly can seem very far away from our shared congregational life, especially if you've never gone to GA, which the majority of you have not ever gone to GA. And after all, we are not beholden to any decision made at General Assembly. Unitarian Universalists are congregationalists, meaning we make our decisions at the congregational level including whether or not we even want to make donations to the Unitarian Universalist Association, the UUA, or participate in its decision-making. 
There have been some years when we have had no, no delegates at General Assembly, and it's not unusual for the decisions made at GA to have no impact on what we do here in the congregation. But that's not always the case. As you hopefully know, but if you don't, here's the news. The UUA is considering revising the section of the bylaws where we articulate the seven principles and six sources of our living faith tradition. Beware of talking about or hearing about the UUA as if they are some body of folks out there different from us. Remember that it's the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. It's us. <laughs> when we say the UUA is deciding something, we are saying that several thousand Unitarian Universalists, delegates from our congregations, have come together to vote and make decisions. So it is we who are considering revising the section of the UUA bylaws where we articulate the seven principles and six sources of our living faith tradition. This section of the bylaws is called Article 2. Hopefully that rings a bell oh, for some of you. <laughs> I haven't we been hearing about Article 2. There's been an Article 2 study commission. They've published a report. The study commission has received feedback. And I have preached seven sermons in the past year about the proposed revisions to this section of the UUA bylaws. And yet the only people I feel fully confident know what I'm talking about are the four congregants who went to GA this year. <laughs> Not because I think nobody cares about this, but just that, again, what's happening at the level of the UUA and General Assembly can feel so far away and disconnected from what we are doing here in our congregation. That disconnection may seem small, but it can be devastating. This year at GA, during one of our business sessions, we spent some substantial time looking at the proposed revisions to Article 2 and proposing further revisions, because we're UUs. And this is, as you might imagine, complex and difficult work to do with several thousand people. But there are, in, with that, there are people who are excited for these changes. And as some changes were proposed and accepted or proposed and voted down, there were delegates present who would clap or cheer in favor of certain changes. And there was one poor delegate, or at least one who spoke up, and who knows if there were more, but one poor delegate who had come to General Assembly with seemingly no idea that we are considering updating this section of the bylaws. Someone who loves the principles as they are and who felt shocked not just that they may be revised, but that people would cheer or clap in favor of these changes. And this delegate came to a microphone to tearfully describe how painful this experience was for her. It was a very memorable moment in our time together. Now, there might be many lessons we take from this story, and one of them is that it is considered bad form in the business sessions to cheer and clap for things to go a certain way. Although, we do certainly cheer and clap when we get something done, <laughs> which again is a challenge with several thousand people. But as a minister, watching this poor delegate re relate their sadness and dismay, my main thought was that I never, ever want any of my congregants to not know what is going on at GA if it is within my power to help keep you informed. So I often have a service about GA after the fact, and sometimes I send an email to the congregation with news and links, almost ensuring that you don't know the news from GA, but <laughs> I can feel good that I sent it out. But today, more than ever, I hope you hear what I'm telling you, that when we, the UUA, vote this coming June 2024 to revise Article 2 of the UUA bylaws, I think there is a very good chance that this will be approved. Why do I think this? Because we are in the middle of a generational shift. And I think that voting to change the bylaws and to update our seven principles to seven values and covenant is a symbol that we are ready for change. A symbol that we understand the world has changed since 1985, almost eight, 40 years. 
and that we are changing with it. It is one of the hallmarks of our faith tradition, after all, that it is a living tradition, growing, evolving, expanding. The proposed changes to this section of our bylaws uh, are too long for us to go over together now, but here is the main takeaway. The central image of our seven values with love at the center, can we bring it up? This is proposed to be in the bylaws. Inseparable from one another, these values are interdependence, equity, transformation, pluralism, generosity, and justice, with love at the center. Love at the center, just as we have in our own mission statement here at Chalice, kismet, holy synchronicity, at the UUA bookstore, you can already buy tote bags and bookmarks with this image on them. And this image is being called, Love is at the Center. So this past June, we voted on 13 amendments to the proposed Article II language. Five of these amendments were approved. And then we voted 86% in favor of preliminarily approving the Article II provisions. That's a high percentage, but everyone understood that voting yes meant we would vote on it a final time this next June. So, we'll see. The final version of the Article II wording with all the incorporated amendments is expected to come out literally any day now. So when it's available, I will email it to the congregation. The other big news from General Assembly this year is that we elected our new UUA president, the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt. She is the first multiracial woman to be elected president of the UUA and the first openly queer person to serve in this position, and she will serve for six years. I took a class taught by Dr. Betancourt when I was at Star King School for the seminary, and I had invited her to preach for us at Chalice as part of our Listening to Black Preachers series back in 2021. Uh, she declined, telling me that she was too busy then with other commitments. And then three months later, I learned she was running for UUA president. <laughs> so she really was too busy to preach for us <laughs> that year. At GA, we were joyful to elect her as our new president. And we were also joyful in celebrating the many accomplishments of our outgoing president including guiding us through the pandemic, the Reverend Susan Frederick Ray. When I send out the link to the updated Article 2 revisions, I will also send a link to a message from Dr. Betancourt so you can see and hear her. She is a scholar and a theologian, and you will hear that in her speaking. And the last thing I want to make sure you know about GA this year is that the Berry Street Essay, a prestigious annual event, was given this year by the Reverend Cecilia Kingman on the topic of fascism. Her talk includes the 10 tactics of political fascism as identified by scholar and author Jason Stanley. If you have a couple of hours to set aside for intellectual pursuit, this is well worth your time and available by video as well as text. You will find much of the information recognizable and helpful. I want to share one more thing about the bylaws and Article 2. One of the proposed amendments would have left the current language of our seven principles and six sources in Article 2, along with the proposed revisions as a historical reminder of these words that we have cherished for so long. Appropriately, we voted no, because our bylaws, anybody's bylaws, shouldn't be a place where we keep old language for the sake of preserving it. But this is what I want to lift up. We don't need to codify old language in our bylaws. Our seven principles and six sources will always be our seven principles and six sources. There's a reason the new language has a different name, values and covenant, 
So we will always know what we mean when we refer to our principles and sources. We aren't throwing them in the trash. We aren't saying this is not who we are anymore. They will live on, even as we may find new ways of expressing who and how we are. Listen again to the words of our reading. Like those old pear-shaped Russian dolls that open at the middle to reveal another and another, down to the pea-sized, irreducible minimum. May we carry our mothers forth in our bellies. May we, born onward by our daughters, ride in the envelope of almost infinity, that chain letter good for the next 25,000 days of our lives. Let's think of the generations of us like those old pear-shaped Russian dolls and the people we love never really disappearing, just being carried with us, within us. May we carry them forth in our bellies. And may we, born onward by the next generation, ride in the envelope of almost infinity, that chain letter good for the 25,000 days of their lives. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. <clears throat> Seated, standing, or online, you are invited to raise your voice in song. of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Pema Chodron writes, generosity is an activity that loosens us up by offering whatever we can, a dollar, a flower, a word of encouragement, we are training and letting go. Please text your donation to Chalice. If you haven't texted a donation before, Know that once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to follow to enter your credit card information. If you've already entered this information previously when you've donated, you won't need to enter it again. If your Sunday donation is meant to be part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate pledge after the dollar amount. The phone number for text donations will be on screen in a moment. If you prefer to make an in-person donation of cash or check, there are envelopes and a donation box to the left of the chapel double doors. You can leave those donations after the service. Please give generously. Please join in dedicating our offering with, I am sorry. <laughs>
please join in dedicating our offering with words of affirmation. A challenge to you, the congregation, our mission is to act to promote beauty and principles in ourselves and in the wider world. The words of our prayer come from the Reverend Kevin Jago, whose words, words are inspired by and adapted from Rabbi Sheila Weinberg from Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis from Middle Church in New York City, Dr. Saleh Kolaki from Los Angeles, and UUA President Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? To love one another may sound simple, but in moments of violence, it is a practice of deep faith and deeper conviction. May we remember the interdependence of our paths and our lives. As we call our collective attention to this violent moment, may we acknowledge this moment is not isolated from history or context. Two peoples, one land. Three faiths, one root, one earth, one mother, one sky, one beginning, one future, one destiny, one broken heart, one God, one love, one humanity. We set our attention on those who have died, those who have lost loved ones, and those who are in danger in this very moment. Grant us a vision of unity. May we see the many in the one and the one in the many. Guide us gently and firmly toward each other, toward peace. May we advocate for paths to less violence and greater freedom. May we not allow grief and anger to erase another's humanity. For Islam teaches peace, for Judaism teaches repair, for Christianity teaches love, and our own Unitarian Universalism teaches justice. All religious tradition calls us toward these themes and to nonviolence when not warped into tools of war. We are one global family living tenuously on the same human impacted earth. Let us center ourselves in justice as we call for peace. To love one another may sound simple, but in moments of violence, it is a practice of deep faith and deeper conviction. As we breathe in, we are connected. As we breathe out, we are connected. May our minds create a vision of the world radical enough to be called holy. May our actions contain the promise of hope and the commitment to justice. May our hearts remember that love is a power that resists all forms of fear. By our thoughts, by our actions, by our hearts, and by our very breath, may it be so. Amen and blessed be. You are invited again to rise and join us.
Our closing words come from Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other. Our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, be loving. Love and blessings to each of you. Blessed be. You are invited to close our time together by singing the well. After our closing hymn, please return to your seats for some announcements. there's been a uh, change in the uh, Haven House program at uh, Interfaith Community Services. Um, we had been cooking and serving dinner there for uh, the past uh, several years, but due to a change in, uh, for many reasons, the, the people that were living in Haven House have moved to a uh, different building across the street called the Turk Center, which now houses uh, people with, uh, with some other needs also, and they will be and the, uh, their, their own staff will be doing the uh, cooking there, and we will just be serving. This coming Saturday, uh, we, we are scheduled to serve again, and we still have some, uh, some openings to fill for people to serve. So you can contact Judy or I, or email havenhouse at, uh, at uh, challengeviewcongregation.org, or just uh, see me afterwards. Thank you. Our social hour will begin in a few minutes online at this same Zoom link and in person at our courtyard. Those of you here in person might want to bring your refreshments into the blue room and have a visit with our online congregants. Reverend Sharon and I look forward to greeting you at the chapel doors to hear how the service was meaningful to you. Go in peace.